Okay, today is a pre-recorded video. Uh, we're going to start truth conditional meaning of sentences and we're going to do slides 1 through 10. That's the goal today. And then on Tuesday when I'm back, we'll do hopefully the rest of the slides 11 through 17. So the first bit, 1 through 10, is setting up uh, what we're doing, truth conditional meaning. What are our syntactic structures? How are we composing meaning through our syntax? And what are the basics of our semantics? And then 11 through 17, when I come back, is actually doing our composition on trees. So what we're doing at this point in the course is after we've learned all of our preliminaries through uh, set theory, relations, um, propositional logic, is you finally get to take a look at syntactic structures and real simple sentences and actually take a look at the meanings of words, the meanings of phrases, the meanings of sentences, and see how we can compose meaning on an actual syntactic tree. So this is truth conditional semantics in linguistics, uh, finally, not just taking a look at mathematics and looking at um, word categories in an abstract sense. We can do this on real sentences. So um, this is compositionality. And to remind you from the beginning of the course, uh, we said this once or twice already, but uh, with our rules, we can generate an infinite number of sentences. We know whether each of those are grammatical or not, and each of those sentences have a meaning that we can interpret, whether we've heard the sentence or not. So Stephen asked me if I could speaker his walls up so he could blast Halsey's new CD, Christmas in Chilliwack, for the neighbors. We've never heard it before, but we know what it means. And we know how meaning is created. Uh, it's not just done on a string of words. A uh, meaning is composed by its parts and how those parts are combined. So what's important from this is that meaning can be determined, uh, determined algorithmically. What this means is that there are a set of rules that we follow, and as long as we follow those rules, we'll be able to get literal meaning from that. Uh, there's no strategies like with a set theory proof where we need creativity to come up uh, with getting an end result. There's just a set of rules that we follow, and as long as we follow those rules and apply them correctly, we get a result. So this is nice because this means that computers can do this um, with just a set of rules and an input. We'll get an output from it. So, if we have a sentence, it is not true that Toby teaches English literature and Kay teaches math. Uh, maybe this wasn't completely clear at the beginning of the course, but now that we have propositional logic, we can actually show this in a different way now. Uh, we know there are two different interpretations. So there's one case if we give these labels. So this is not, uh, let's call this T for Toby teaches English. This is and, this is K for K teaches math. We know there's two ways that these can be put together because this is structurally ambiguous. So this can be not T, and k, that can be one interpretation, or this could be not t and k. So when we say that semantics isn't done on a string of words, but rather on a syntactic object, well, this is what we mean. In order to understand what the meaning is, we need to know what the structure of the sentence is. And uh, these can be broken down into structures, of course. So there's uh, not t, um, then this is joined with and, and then that would be joined with k. Or we could do uh, t and k first, and then join the not to that. So I'm omitting uh, some nodes a little bit for brevity, um, but we can see there's some different structures there. And what's also nice about, our, nice about our system is that no matter what language that we work with, the way that we do composition is the same. So I have the sentence, he eats fish in three different languages. Uh, these all have different word orders. And although pronouns may work differently in each language, and although the reference of the word fish and its equivalent or uh, he or eat might not mean exactly the same thing, because I'm not quite sure um, in Malagasy if the reference are exactly the same as they are in English and Japanese. Um, that's really besides the point. But if we take a look at, say, the verb phrase, for instance, uh, no matter what language you work in, the meaning of the verb phrase is going to be determined by the meaning of the verb and the object. It doesn't matter what the order of the verb and the object are, 
It doesn't matter where the verb and the object are in the sentence. The composition strategy, the algorithm, is the same. So no matter what language we work with, uh, we can still use the same principles. It's much like in syntax. Uh, if we talk about what complements are, the meaning of the complement is the same no matter what language you look at, but the position is different. Uh, adjuncts mean the same thing in every language, uh, and they can occur in whatever position, but they can be removed. That's what an adjunct means, but every language uses them differently or places them differently. Um, specifier is the same thing. The position of the specifier varies from language to language, but it has the same meaning across every language. So let's get into terms. And I've tried to um, specify some of these as we went through our preliminaries, so that way uh, we could tie some of these into linguistics as we learn them. But as a refresher, I have to really specify these again in the context where we need them. Uh, linguistic meaning is associated between a linguistic expression and an object in the model or world. So uh, basically, we can define things in the real world or in some situation, and that gives it meaning. So uh, the object in which the expression is associated is its denotation. Um, so uh, we can talk about denotations here, and maybe this will explain what denotations are a little bit better. So proper names are individuals in the world. So um, individuals denote people obviously. So how do we represent people in mathematics? Well, we did these with elements. So from set theory, we can represent proper names with elements. So that's why we did some set theory at the beginning. Uh, verbs use relations, and relations come from set theory as well. I mean, we can also just say that these are sets, um, but specifically we say relations because we're looking usually at um, pairs for transitive verbs, triplets for ditransitive verbs, uh, intransitive verbs look for uh, a bunch of singletons. But uh, these are still sets in the end. Sentences uh, denote truth values. So sentences are either true or false. But they have some condition associated with them. So uh, if a sentence is true, uh, there's some condition that makes it true. So as we build up our tree, uh, each word gets a category, and that category gets some meaning associated with it. It gets a denotation. So a proper name would have an element associated with it. A verb would have a relation or set associated with it. Um, so a verb phrase is going to have some relation meaning associated with it. But if we think about a verb phrase and a transitive verb and some noun, well, specifically, let's say it's a proper name. Well, we would have an element, and we'd have a set, but this verb phrase is going to be a set too. So we're going to have to figure out some way to get a meaning in the verb phrase that's a set that combines a set and an element together to get the meaning of a set. And similarly, when we build up uh, to the sentence level and we get another element and a set, well, a sentence has to be a truth value. So... Uh, we're combining all these different bits of mathematics together in order to build up the truth conditions of a sentence. So uh, these are all about denotations here. So proper names denote elements, verbs denote relations or sets, and sentences denote truth values. Um, and a lot of the other categories fit in with verbs, so things like nouns, uh, adjectives, prepositions, and so on. Okay, so for sentences, if we want to know whether a sentence is true or false, we have to have some situation. So uh, we need to know some facts about the world. And the facts about the world uh, relate to the truth conditions. So if we say uh, Jesse likes Mr. Clean, uh, we need to know some truth conditions. So we would have to say if. Jesse likes Mr. Clean is true, then we need some world where um, Jesse is in a set of people uh, who like Mr. Clean. So uh, in a situation, we could take a look at all the people out there. We could take a look at all the people who like Mr. Clean. We could check to see if Jesse's in that set. 
And then if he's in that set, we could say the sentence is true. And if he's not in the set, we could say the sentence is false. So uh, that's an example. But usually most of the time, uh, we're not working with specific situations. We're just looking at a general trend because we don't know the facts about the world. So for example, in this sentence, Tom Cruise took a cold shower on the evening of August 9th, 1995. Uh, we don't know if this is true or not. Uh, we don't know the facts, but we can talk about what we would need to know for the sentence to be true. Um, and this is more practical in our sense, um, because we can talk about the truth conditions without actually knowing what happens in the real world. Um, instead, uh, once we have the facts at some point, then we could verify it and say, oh, it's true or oh, it's false. Okay, so um, that's really just what the top half is talking about. You know, if, if we know the facts, uh, sorry, if we know what the sentence means, then uh, whether we have the facts or not, it doesn't matter. We can say whether it's true once we know the facts. Um, but if we don't know what the sentence means, then the facts are useless because we could have all the facts in the world. Uh, if we don't know what the sentence means, then we can't say whether the sentence is true or false. Okay. So we're composing things formally, which means that we have a formal definition of what meaning is and how we do our sentence structure. So there is a fancy little definition down here. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about what the definition means. Instead, I'm going to illustrate it. So basically what this is saying is that we do a meaning composition on a syntactic tree rather than on a word. Well, we can do it on words as well, but in the end, what we're doing is we're assigning truth to a sentence. So if we have a sentence, we're saying that S means something if S is true in some situation. So I'm sort of drawing a picture here for what's on the left. So what this says is that this sentence, this structure, is true in some situation. So this is a situation. This says it's true. Uh, this P is just the conditions. So uh, we'll talk about what the conditions are as we go through uh, the formal rules next week on Tuesday. And then of course, uh, this is your S, this is your sentence. So there's a lot of talk on the left, so S means P is the same thing as saying S is true in V if and only if some conditions hold. Uh, S is the structural description of a sentence, V is a situation, and P describes the condition. Basically, we're saying that um, a structure is true in a situation if some conditions hold. So um, we, we do semantics on a structure, not just on a string of words. So uh, we'll see how this works as we go through. Okay, so what I want to do is more so the practical application, because a lot of the theory that we see uh, that I talked about will be shown explicitly as we work through this stuff. So what you're going to notice is that the syntax that we use is very, very simple, uh, much simpler than anything you've ever done in linguistics before. Uh, and that's because we're only using what we can use. And you're going to find out very quickly that what we can use is quite limited and that we'll have to go back to the drawing board, uh, go in more depth into logic uh, quite quickly to develop some more tools so that way we can get a more interesting syntax, uh, which is unfortunate that we have to go back to math so quickly, um, but it does show uh, what a strong base we need to get interesting syntax. So uh, let's talk about how the rules are written on the left. So uh, we have these bars here, and this just means or. So uh, you'll see rules like S goes to NVP. So what this means is that if you have an S at the top, this branches out in order from left to right, NVP. And then we have this or branch. So this can mean that or S can branch out to an S a conjunction and an S. So if you've learned X-bar theory, you might have been told, uh, you don't want to have more than two branches coming out of any node. Uh, yes, in X-bar theory, that's true. However, uh, that's not going to happen at this point in semantics. So we're going to have three branches coming out of a node. Uh, 
If we want just two branches, it's a little bit too complicated and it doesn't work nicely with conjunctions. So we're not gonna do that at this point. In fact, we're not doing that in this course, maybe in a graduate course. Uh, so a sentence can also go to an S in negation S. So that's down here. Uh, the other rule we have is a VP can go to an intransitive verb, VI. So this says intransitive. So intransitive is something like sleeps. It only takes a subject. So you can say X sleeps, but you can't say X sleeps Y. Uh, or a VP can go to a transitive verb and another noun. So the T stands for transitive. So this is of the form X does something to Y. So this could be like X eats Y or X knows Y or something like that. Okay, so another thing you probably noticed is that we do not have NPs. Uh, we only have Ns. And that's because in this fragment of English, which we call F1, a very limited syntax, uh, we are only using proper names. So this N is specifically limited to proper names. So when we have more than one type of noun, we'll introduce an NP. Uh, but at this point, N is specific to proper names. And that's because we don't know yet how to handle common nouns like dog or cat. We don't have the tools yet to work with that. Uh, that's how limited we are in our syntax. Uh, as far as things like conjunction, uh, what I want to specify here is that this conjunction is the syntactic category conjunction. So this includes all of the logical operators except for if then. Um, well, on an assignment, it might include if then, but in the terms of these lecture slides for F1, it's words like and or but. Uh, and negation is specifically just it is not the case that or it is not true that. Um, this does not include just not on its own. Uh, we do not negate verbs in this in this fragment. We only negate sentences as a whole. So we would never say, I do not eat. We would say, it is not the case that X eats or X eats Y. Um, so if you might be asking, why are we doing that? It's because it gets a little bit too complicated. Uh, if we just negate the verb, we get ambiguity, we get some movement behind the scenes. So yes, this syntax is incredibly simple, but we need it to be simple because it's all we can handle at this point. Okay, so very simple rules. We're going to do some practice with the rules. So you can pause the video, try to draw these tree structures. Um, so I guess I should go through this example first for Jack is hungry. Uh, Jack is the subject, so Jack is a noun. Uh, is hungry. So even though is hungry is the copula be plus an adjective, uh, we're going to treat these as an intransitive verb. So there's no object here. Uh, it's is hungry. So just a subject and um, this predicate adjective we're going to treat as a vi. So we're going to use a triangle here. If you want to just use vi and go is hungry with a straight line, I don't care too much. You're also free to do that but we'll treat that as an intransitive verb. So that goes up to the VP because we just have a rule VP goes to VI and the sentence breaks into a noun and a verb phrase here. Okay, so you can pause these and do these and I'll just draw these right out right now. So, Sophia likes James. Uh, so this is a sentence without any operators on it. So this will break up into a noun and a verb phrase. Uh, Sophia is the subject of the sentence, uh, likes James. This is a verb, a transitive verb with an object after. So the transitive verb is likes, and then James is our object. So that's A. B, it is not the case that James is cute. So I get it is not the case at the beginning. Uh, so this is a negation. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this a bit, and if you want to abbreviate this on your assignments or homework or whatever, it's fine too. It is not the case that. It is not is fine. I know what you mean. Uh, that James is cute. So 
Uh, this breaks out into s to a negation and an s. So it is not the case that. And then James is cute. So James is cute. This is just a noun and a verb phrase. Uh, James is our subject. Uh, is cute. So this is a case here where is cute is like this predicate adjective. So we treat this as an intransitive verb. On an assignment at some point, you might break this up into two parts and you'll get uh, streamlined along on how to do this. So this is a VI and we'll abbreviate this as is cute. Okay, so that's B. It is not the case that, just for completion, I'll write that in. Uh, James is cute. Okay, C. C is a little bit more complex. Jack is hungry, and it is not the case that James likes Jack. So we have a little bit more to work with. Uh, we have a compound sentence with and in the middle. So we're going to have to use our conjunction rule. So and will be in the middle. On the left, we have Jack is hungry. So this is a case of an NVP with an intransitive verb. So is hungry. And the subject here is Jack. So Jack is hungry is our left sentence or our left clause. And it is not the case that James likes Jack is on the right. So that S on the right is going to go to a negation. And uh, we'll do it is not that. And what are we left with? It is not the case that James likes Jack. So we have a subject, James. Then we have a verb phrase. And we have likes Jack. So uh, we have a transitive verb, likes. And then we have another noun, which is the object here, Jack. So it is not the case that James likes Jack. Okay, that's C. Uh, now for D, we have a ambiguous sentence with two trees. It is not the case that Jack is hungry or Sophia is boring. So what I might do is just remind myself what the two structures are. So it could be not uh, J or S, where J or S is being negated, or it could be not J or S, or just J is being negated. So two structures there. I'm going to clear both of these trees so I have room. So I'm going to do the top one first. So first I'm going to do an S and break it off into a negation and an S. Um, just for the sake of space here, I'm not going to write the words out. I'm just going to do the structure because we know what the words are. So negation is it is not the case that. Uh, now we're going to do Jack is hungry or Sophia is boring. So there's going to be an or in the middle. So we're going to have a conjunction between the two. So the left is going to be Jack is hungry. So that'll be a noun, Jack. And then the VP, VI is hungry. So I will do is hungry here, just so we know that this is where that is. Uh, conjunction will be or. And the right side is Sophia is boring. So this intransitive verb is is boring. So that's one structure. It is not the case that Jack is hungry or Sophia is boring. Uh, so this is the case where we have not J or S. The second tree, uh, we can have not J or S. So J is being negated and S is not being negated in this case. So first what we do, um, if we think about the actual structure of this sentence, uh, we have uh, not coming together with J, then that comes together with or, and then S. So really we want S going to uh, conjunction first and then breaking up into two S's. The left side goes to a negation and S, which then goes to its subject and intransitive verb. So we get is hungry on the left side. So it is not the case that Jack is hungry is our left uh, clause. And then the right clause would be uh, or Sophia is boring. So noun verb VI. And then this would be is boring. 
So the difference between these two really is where this negation is attaching. Uh, is the negation just negating uh, one of the clauses as on the right side, or is it negating both of the clauses as on the left side? Okay. So the syntax is much simpler than anything you've seen in Link 220 or Link 322, probably, um, but still, uh, it is an adjustment. Uh, when you go from doing more difficult stuff to easier stuff, uh, it's still easy to make a mistake because it's easy to overcomplicate things in your head. So that's why there's practice for this. Okay, so just a couple more things before we're done today. Uh, just to sort of refresh your mind, a lot of this stuff is uh, review, which is why I'm just going to include it today. And if there's any questions, we'll answer those on Tuesday. So we'll um, review this last slide in particular on Tuesday. Okay, so well, we saw this a little bit in propositional logic, but we have these little square brackets. So if we have anything that's not a sentence, then uh, we'll use the letter alpha for this. So if we have, say, a proper name or a verb, then we use the square brackets and a little v in the top left. So this stands for situation or circumstance. And this just says that the, the semantic value of alpha in a situation or circumstance v is something. So, uh, for example, if I say, if I want to know the value of Jack in situation v, I would write this. And uh, this could stand for some person, but usually with proper names, we would pick a letter J and give it a little prime symbol. And we'll see how this is done on that tenth slide. Uh, if it's a sentence, uh, it's a truth value. So uh, we would do the same thing as we did with logic. Uh, we would give it a one or a zero, and then S would be true if it's one, and S would be zero if it's false. The difference is we're putting a little V on top, and this is our situation or circumstance. So uh, now we're always analyzing things relative to some situation or circumstance, because when we analyze whether people like people or people are tired, uh, we're looking at some universe full of people. So that way we can say whether it's true or false in some situation. Um, okay, so this is sort of a refresher of what was said earlier with the theory. So if we want to build uh, truth within our trees, um, there's something that we need to be able to do to start. So if we have a base point, uh, let's, let's just start with a base point, something very straightforward. So if we have, say, an intransitive verb, uh, let's just start with just the VI node, like eats or sleeps. If we want to start a composition, we need all of our terminal nodes. So uh, this is what we call a terminal node because it's at the very bottom of a tree. All of these terminal nodes need to be assigned a lexical value. So a lexical value is a value that's just given to the word itself. So uh, these are not um, done... Uh, so, so these are just like a dictionary full of values for words. And there's a systematic way that we'll be assigning values. Um, so these don't need any sort of rule that applies to them um, based on other things in the tree. These are just the values that they start with. So sort of how in relations when we had likes, these are the set of x uh, pairs x, y, such that x likes y. Um, sleeps would be given the set of x such that x sleeps. This is its inherent lexical value. We also need, then, every node above a terminal node and every node above those nodes to get a value based on its daughters. So in this case, this only has one daughter, but you might have another case where, say, you have a VP uh, with a transitive verb and a noun. Uh, the meaning of the VP should be based on its two daughters, uh, the transitive verb and the noun. So 
Um, if you might have forgotten these terms, uh, so if you have A, B, and C, uh, the relation from A to B and C is what's called daughters, so B and C are daughters of A. Uh, you could also say that A is the mother of B and C. These are just tree relations. And then you would also say that B and C are sisters of each other. So this is just a little for pressure for terminology for tree relations. So um, these are two things that we need in order to do uh, composition on our trees. We need all of the bottom nodes on our trees to have values for the words. And then all of our nodes above those non uh, above those terminals and above those nodes uh, to get values based on the daughters. And we'll construct rules for those. Okay. I'm just going to clear this bit up. So there's three different ways we can draw these rules. And they all mean the same thing. So usually we use the arrow notation when we talk about rules for syntax. Like when I say, uh, what does an S break down into or what does a VP break down into? Uh, usually when we talk about semantic rules, we use this block notation. So these mean the same thing, um, but A is subscripted in the corner. So this just means that A is the, the mother is down here and the daughters are in bigger letters, separated. Uh, when we have tree structures, of course, uh, tree structures, or for illustration purposes, we usually draw them out uh, where, of course, the mother is on top and there's lines down to the daughters. So these mean exactly the same thing, but they're used in different circumstances. Okay, so finally, here is the last thing. Some examples of terminal nodes and how connectives are represented. So, um, here's how proper names are done. Whenever we're given proper names, we usually just write the proper name, the value of the proper name, as the same thing with the little tick at the end. So, what this just tells us is that this is not the word itself, but this represents the object. So, this is the thing in the real world. We could draw pictures instead of... Um, the name itself, but if we draw pictures, it's difficult to type out. Uh, you can also shorthand these with just a capital letter. So usually I will just use a capital letter with a tick instead of the full name because it's quicker to write. Uh, if we have intransitive verbs, so, so these are ands, if we have intransitive verbs, we're looking for singletons. So these are our relations. So is boring, this is the set of x such that x is boring in v. What's new? is that we're specifying in V because it's in a situation. So if we're looking in a situation V, we have to specify this is the set of X such that X is boring in that situation V. If we have a transitive verb, we're looking for pairs X and Y. Why? Because X is our subject and Y is our object. So we're looking for pairs of X and Y where X likes Y in V. So if we take a look at the tree for this, and maybe this makes a little bit more sense now if it didn't make sense before. In our tree structure, we're looking for a subject X, and we're looking for an object Y. So we need those two things. So this verb on its own, just at this point in the tree, it hasn't found a subject. It hasn't found an object. It's looking for subjects and objects. That's why the meaning of the verb itself is looking for an X, it's looking for a Y. It's looking for pairs of things, a subject that likes an object. So this is how um, our three categories, the noun, the intransitive verb, and the transitive verb is denoted. So if you get any new type of uh, intransitive verb or transitive verb, you should be able to come up with a set very quickly because it just follows the exact same uh, sort of formula as we have here. Uh, connectives are written a little bit differently, but they're written the same way that truth tables are, or they work the same way that truth tables are, but they're just written in, a, in an arrow notation for functions. So before with it is not the case that uh, if we write the truth table for p and not p, 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, this is the same thing 
but the notation we use is what's called a matrix notation for functions. So this is saying that one gets turned to zero and zero gets turned to one, but uh, it's in a notation for functions. Uh, in terms of and, so if we, if we ever see the meaning of and, again, this works very similar. So P, Q, P, and Q. Uh, I won't use colors this time, but one, zero, zero, zero. What this does is it takes pairs. So it says these are pairs of entries because order matters in pairs. Uh, P would be the left clause, Q would be the right clause. And if P and Q are both true, it outputs true. If P is true and Q is false, it outputs zero. If P is false and Q is true, it outputs zero. And if P and Q are both, both false, it outputs zero. And then we put little square brackets around it and we say this is a function. So this is how and would be represented for our entries in our trees. Um, if this were or, well, how would this change? Well, in the second line and third line, it would be true. And that's because uh, in our truth tables, it would be true in the second and third line as well, because at least one of those has to be true. So uh, that's all I wanted to talk to you about today for uh, Friday's recorded video. Um, on Tuesday, we'll review this last slide. So if you have any questions, of course, you can email me before then, but um, we will uh, review this as well in class. And uh, then we'll talk about how the rules are constructed with our trees and do some examples on Tuesday. So a lot of this will be application and there will be quite a bit of practice that uh, we can do in class and a lot of time that we can take to go over any questions that you have. Uh, the assignment is also due on Tuesday, so please ask questions if you have anything, any questions about that. Um, if there are a lot of questions, yeah, just uh, let me know. So I'm still available uh, on Thursday and Friday for email, and I'll also be available on Monday for appointments. So yeah, um, if there are any questions, please let me know. I just repeated that seven times, but I have no idea how to end this pre-recorded video because it's been so long since I've done it. So enjoy your weekend.